This time on the Highland Woodworker. Is the Industrial Revolution changed plane making and before that the plane maker dealt with uh, the end user face to face. A look inside the wood shop and the mind of Larry Williams, one of the world's most prolific 18th century British style plane makers. Plus, get a glimpse of how Larry and his woodworking partner Don McConnell put these sought after hand tools together and we'll demystify the setting of the iron. Also, have you ever come up short using a router to make a dado? Popular Woodworking Magazine's David Teal shows us how some blue tape will keep you from seeing red. These stories and more, this time on the Highland Woodworker. Hello, I'm Charles Brock and I'm a Highland Woodworker. 40 years. That's how long Highland Woodworking has been providing the finest tools to woodworkers and the best woodworking education, if I do say so myself. When it comes to wooden hand planes, there are few makers on this planet as good as Larry Williams. He invited us to his Arkansas workshop and tells us his story. He's an Arkansas living treasure. Don't believe me? Just ask the Arkansas Arts Council, who gave the prestigious award to Larry Williams in 2006 for his work in the craft of handmade hand planes. These wonderful cutting edge tools are now highly sought after and sold around the world. But for Larry, these fine tools were first produced out of necessity when he set up shop high in the Ozarks. Well, I was working as a carpenter here, and custom carpentry is one of a kind stuff. So the hand planes were useful to me. Then I couldn't find what I wanted, so I decided to start making them. A few years later, we had an ice storm and I fell and broke my arm. And nobody needs one arm carpenter in a small town. That's all I had to fall back on. Tell us about your plane style, why it was chosen, and why you see it as a better style than, than others. Well, and that's personal opinion, but uh, th basically as the Industrial Revolution changed plane making, and before that uh, uh, the plane maker dealt with uh, the end user face to face, and things had to be right. And the, the plane maker was more directly descended from uh, woodworking trades. Did you find uh, plans for a plane, or, or how did you get started with that? Uh, studying the old ones, and then, uh, which give you an idea of what kind of tools they used, and reading, and, and then floats weren't available anywhere. Now, so, what's a float and what is it used for? Well, it's uh, like a real coarse tooth file, mostly shaping, flattening. Uh, it can do coarse work or finish work. Uh, so in building a plane, you have to uh, prepare a bed. Right. It, does the float help prepare the bed? The float will definitely help prepare the bed. And then the molding planes, you have a mortise that you have to work in. Some of them are only an eighth of an inch wide. Uh, so, yeah, you need special tools to do that. And that's so, where we had to start. We're fortunate in that a lot of the old tools survive. And so we know where we're headed. And generally, you can even find tool marks inside them to tell how they were made. I would be real interested and seeing the first plane you made, I'm sure you're very proud of it. Uh, no, no, I burned it. Uh, I burned a number of planes. Well, uh, do you just like fire or you weren't proud of it? Uh, I could do better. <laughs> I understand the feeling. I think I'm gonna go home and become an arsonist. I've got <laughs> lots of old things I've built that need to go into the plane. Yeah, well, we have the advantage of having a wood stove here, so. <laughs> The mistakes all go in the stove. Larry put his wood and metal working skills 
to good use and in the mid-1990s teamed up with fellow plane maker Bill Clark and began selling their popular hand planes under the Clark and Williams label. Along the way, they were able to bring one more person aboard, Don McConnell, a hand tool historian and traditional maker, who also played a pivotal role in bringing their hand planes to a whole new audience. He not only encouraged me, but helped introduce me to Jay Gaynor at Colonial Williamsburg and they started purchasing and using our planes. That was the big break, I guess. Oh, that was a huge break, yeah. yeah. We, we couldn't have bought the advertising they give us. So is it the Headley shop? Uh, uh, Headley, the Carpenters, the Wheelwrights, uh, 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 boy, the Blacksmiths have got some of our planes. Uh, the Foundry. I understand this is a Snipes Bill plane and this is a special piece of wood with ingrain that is used here. Explain it to me. Well, that, uh, traditionally that particular type of work was done with boxwood, which is why it's called boxing. Uh, we're using persimmon, which has very similar characteristics. And by presenting essentially the end grain there, it uh, holds that profile. Uh, it doesn't wear, it, it keeps it uh, crisp and clean and, and it stays there. It also uh, eliminates short grain, the orientation of it, uh, here at the mouth. So what looks to be real simple is actually very complex. Uh, yeah, we haven't even started yet. All right, well I'm scared <laughs> to death already, Don. Uh, and uh, this profile. Mm -hmm. Tell me about it. What is it used for? Well, it's used uh, for a couple of different things. Most people who are familiar with them uh, do know that they can be used to make quirks or uh, small little channels in molding or decorative edgings and so on. Uh, the other thing that they can be used for is in making cornice moldings, uh, particularly uh, where you're working on the spring, uh, it can start in a gauge line and start a rabbit for defining the various elements of the molding. Yeah, so that's kind of the reference itself. Mm -hmm. Yes, it, it yes. Is, mm -hmm. is the gauge line. Right. This is already pretty well along, but rather than go through all those stages, uh, the, the boxing, uh, or in this case uh, persimmon, is already in place. We cut the, the shoulder and the grip out uh, using on, on the table saw. Uh, and then the next thing that we do is make two saw cuts. Uh, uh, we, that can be done by hand, and we do do it that way sometimes, but we, we do it on, on the, the mill for the most part uh, anymore here. And then this part, uh, the mouth and the escapement, is excavated out using chisels. And then we bore down through to, to begin to create uh, the wedge mortise. Uh, that's what it looks like when it comes off the mill. That also can be done by hand, uh, but we have the means to do it on the mill. Uh, and then this uh, example here started out looking essentially the same. I've already opened up that wedge mortise more uh, so that I can get the wedge entered in here. And we just thought we'd show a little bit the use of, of the floats in getting that wedge farther in. The wedges we plane to final thickness using this kind of a fixture here and a uh, smoothing plane, uh, although I think Larry's using a trying plane more now, uh, finding that useful. And once I have that, then I start to enter it here. Um, and this is an area where, yes, you can use chisels, but you're, you're down, you know, sort of standing on your head trying to see what's going on and so forth. And uh, I have done it, and it's very, very much touch and go. So plane makers develop floats um, for use uh, down in here, as well as for bedding and other purposes. And the idea here is, is to slowly let that wedge down in. Now, I've already cleaned up the blind side, in other words, the non-escapement side, pretty well down through there, so I'm mostly be working on the escapement side. And this is a pool uh, cheek float that I'm using here, a small one. 
So and the escapement side is the open side. That's correct, yeah. Uh, and I'll uh, just, uh, it allows you, I'm not sure how well this will show, but to work right up to that pencil line. Just, uh, and just open that up just, and you can see that's starting to go down in a little farther now. And it's just a matter now of, of working down through. Stock selection is very important too, isn't it? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. I'll see, I see you have uh, straight grain uh, for most of the components. Uh, yes, yeah. well, uh, typically it's quarter sawn. We try to get it fairly straight grained as much mm -hmm. as we can. Yeah. Yes, uh, the, the quarter sawing means in most planes that the most stable dimension of the plane then is the height. Right. And that way, the fit of the wedge and the iron and the bed and all that uh, stays more uniform. And so that's, that's, uh, uh, that's the big advantage of that. And so you have these floats in all different sizes. Yes. Mm -hmm. See, that's going down farther in now. That's, I don't think I have to show all of that, but that gives you the idea. Uh, that, that's correct. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I can see how that would be the, the best way to open up that right. mortise and right. get a, a nice fit. Several years ago, Bill Clark said a friendly goodbye to Larry and Don. So the duo reorganized their company and now produced their planes under the Old Street Tool brand. The name may have changed, but their commitment to making these high quality 18th century British style planes certainly has not all while Larry continues to hurdle a health obstacle. I have essential tremors, my, my hands shake, and there are the, they're two kinds. One is they do it all the time, and the kind that I have is when you're concentrating, they start shaking. Is that right? Yeah, when you're really paying attention to what you're trying to do, that's when they shake the worst. Someone like you that has to work to such uh, tolerances, uh, that's got to be very hard, but you found ways to overcome it. Uh, tell us about it. Well, the, my nephew's fiance is an occupational therapist and she's the one that's helped me the most. And uh, I've got wrist weights that all they do is dampen the trimmers and they help a lot. Uh, yeah, I need to make more crutches to have something to rest on. Larry, uh, what would you like for your legacy to be? Evidently, it's gonna be your stamp on the end of a, of a hand plane and somebody looking at it and using it. And, but what would you say your legacy should be? Uh, we've, we've created our own competition. We've helped a lot of people get started. In fact, the, some of them are good enough that they're making a scramble to keep uh, competitive. And that's what I like the most is that we have recreated uh, uh, not only plane making, but uh, we're, what we do was multiple trades back when the planes were made originally. So you've built a community almost, uh, or extended a community of, of plane makers. Yes. Uh, that, that is a great accomplishment. And, and uh, you know, they don't all agree with me uh, on things, and that's fine. Uh, no, they should go their own way. And make it their own. Yes, and I, I think that's important. But I think plane making now has a place in woodworking that it didn't when I started. Coming up, we'll head back to Larry Williams' workshop and get some tap lessons. But first, Pop Wood's David Teal shows us how a little blue tape can get us out of a very common sticky situation. Stick around. You're watching the Highland Woodworker. I'm just an average down-to-earth woodworker. On a scale of one to 10, I'm probably about a five. But one place I score a perfect 10 is right here. And I plan on keeping all 10. 
That's why I have a saw stop table saw. And there's more. Plenty of power, superior dust collection, and absolute accuracy. These features have made it the best selling cabinet saw in America. Let Highland Woodworking help you put a saw stop in your shop. Highland Woodworking stocks a wide selection of Rikon power tools known for their innovative design and rugged durability. Highland has sold thousands of Rikon's industry-leading bandsaws with sizes to fit every woodworking need, from the compact affordable 10-inch model to competitively priced 14 and 18-inch models. Shop us also for Rikon's reliable planers, lathes, and professional low-speed grinder, all with an exceptional five-year warranty. Rikon. Power tools. Woodworkers count on American-made forest saw blades for smooth, quiet cuts every time, without splintering, scratching, or tear-outs. The famous Woodworker 2 is the all-purpose combination blade, but for special cuts, Woodworker 2s are available for cutting dovetails, for flat bottom joinery, a 30-tooth blade is perfect for ripping, a 48-tooth blade for superior cross cuts, and a finger joint blade set. There is a perfect forest woodworker too for every table saw cut. Highland Woodworking has been a leader in woodworking education for more than 30 years. They offer all kinds of woodworking classes year round, ranging from how to hand cut dovetails and mortises to how to sharpen a plane or a chisel, how to build a cabinet, a chair, or a bookcase, or how to turn a wooden bowl. There are classes on wood finishing, French polishing, and even antique furniture restoration. For a list of upcoming classes that may interest you, just look in their catalog or go to highlandwoodworking.com. Hey there Highland Woodworker fans, here at Popular Woodworking we are happy to share our tips and tricks with you for every episode. Take a look at this one, hope you enjoy it. Lots of us have used a two path router method to come up with the right dimension to fit plywood in particular because the plywood is never exactly three quarters of an inch. And you can get it right and well, it fits just barely. It's not going to fit. You need to be a little wider. So what do we do? Well, you can tap this a little bit further away, hair at a time, hair at a time, so that it fits in and you can get just to right where you need it to be. The problem with that is I've only got one clamp on this. If I tap this over, I'm not staying parallel. So without moving this fence, what do I do? Here's the cool trick. To the rescue, blue tape. Everybody's got it in their shop. Now the fun part is you can take some blue tape and you can put a piece or two or three if you got a sense of how short you are and put it on the fence face. That's a pretty thin adjustment, okay? But if you want to sneak up on something, this is a great way to do it. Or you could put it right on the edge of the router itself and make a pass and see how that works. Or you could do both, I guess, as long as you're working from the same side. Then you make a second pass. See how close you are. There you go. We snuck up on just the perfect size. 
with just hmm, four or five pieces of tape. Really quick, you're ready to go the next time. Hope you enjoyed that trick. Look for another one on the next episode of The Highland Woodworker. Coming up, we're headed back to Larry Williams' shop to iron out some plain details many woodworkers would want to know about. You're watching The Highland Woodworker. A lot of folks say they just don't make tools like they used to anymore. I don't know, I suppose that's true in some cases. But the good stuff is still out there. I'm talking about the tools that are just a pleasure to use, that are well designed to get the job done quickly and efficiently, and are made to last so they'll get passed on to the next generation. Whatever tools my grandkids use, I know one thing, they'll be keeping them Tormek sharp. For 35 years, Lee has manufactured the world's best joinery jigs. From our award-winning dovetail jigs and mortise and tenon jigs, to newer innovations like router table jigs. Easily add strong, beautiful joinery to your woodworking pieces, like half-blind dovetails, box joints, mortise and tenon joints, and through dovetails. Lee, simply the easiest and most versatile router joinery jigs. Whiteside Machine Company has been in business for over 30 years providing customers with quality American-made router bits. Fine Woodworking Magazine has declared Whiteside router bits best overall and best value when compared against 17 other brands. No matter the router application, they have the type and profile of carbide router bit you need. When you put a Whiteside router bit to work in your shop, it is guaranteed to make you smile. If you can't make it to Highland Woodworking in Atlanta, Georgia, you can shop online at highlandwoodworking.com. They're great at getting what you want to your shop quick. Earlier in the show, we introduced you to wooden hand plane makers, Larry Williams and Don McConnell. Now let's go back to their workshop where they will teach us their way of setting the iron on a plane. You've got to see this. Well, Don, there are lots of mysteries here, but one mystery is why do you tap? How much do you need to tap to set the iron? And when do you stop? Uh, okay. I guess. Well, a lot of that, of course, is through experience. You learn that, and it does vary a little bit from plane to plane. No two planes are exactly alike. Uh, but maybe, well, hopefully I can explain a few things to, to clarify a little bit. And I think this is one of the bigger barriers to a lot of people uh, thinking about wanting to work with wooden planes. Um, and really what it comes down to is very simple and basic uh, physics. Uh, I'm, not a, I'm, I, I, I'm not into physics per se, so I may not use exactly the right terms, but essentially what, what happens is that you, the, the tapping has to do with uh, inertia and the, the simple idea that for every force or action there's an equal and opposite reaction. And so if you apply force, for example, to the mass of the body of a plane, either on the heel or on the toe downwards, the body of the plane either wants to move forward in response to that or down and the mass of the iron even though it's locked in with a wedge relatively wants to stay put and so the body of the plane moves relative to the iron and uh, I will show you uh, how that works particularly in this case I'm going to go ahead and take the iron out okay. now these are single iron planes so one of the things you want to make sure is that you have a hold of the, the wedge and the iron here in some fashion so that the iron doesn't fall out through the mouth. Okay, uh, that's not so good for your toes or the <laughs> iron. And then just uh, a nice sharp wrap 
We'll oh. back that iron enough. And since the wedge and the iron are both tapered, you know, that slight movement loosens it relative to the plane. Um, now, that's the easy part. And you could do the same thing by tapping on the toe down. Uh, in fact, for, for adjusting the iron, that's actually often a lot more effective than tapping on the heel. Uh, I'm in the habit of tapping on the heel uh, because most of the planes that I've used over the years didn't have strike buttons um, in, in the toe of the plane uh, to take those, those wraps. Um, well, where I usually err mm -hmm. is in trying to set the depth. Yes, okay, well I was getting, I was going to come around to that. In fact, yeah, I, I reset the iron without really saying anything because I'm just in the habit of doing it. Now, uh, in fact, let me redo that so that I can talk about that. Uh, didn't wrap that quite hard enough. Okay. When I, the, different people do this differently, so this is not a, everybody must do it this way, but this is the way I like to do it. Uh, I like to put my finger right on the mouth of the plane, and even a little bit of pressure so that it's sticking up in there just a little bit, so that when I set the iron down in there, it's actually being held back slightly from where I'm going to want it. Um, the reason for that is it's much more direct and easy to set the iron down than it is to back it off in a controlled manner. I can see that. Uh, so I like to start there and then simply put the wedge in, make sure everything's where you want it or close, and then tap the wedge. Now, one of the mistakes that a lot of people make, especially when it comes to setting the wedge, is they feel they have to really bang away at that really hard. If you've got the proper fit, just a nice sharp ripe wrap like that should, should be enough to set it. Now, that iron is, you can see, farther up in than I would normally like, actually. Okay. Just, and then it's the same principle in adjusting that iron down to cut is, is the, you know, the simple physics, but in this case, the iron is the one that's wanting to move relative to the plane body. So you just simply tap it down. Now, in theory, you could also wrap on the toe, and that would, and, and, uh, that would have the same effect. But this is just much more direct and more is. controllable. So it's really in my, and you just tap that. And the last thing you ever do, whatever adjustment you make, is one more wrap on that wedge to make sure it's all set. Um, now, I don't have it clear down yet, but that iron has come down quite a bit. But that's the process. Uh, that's the process. And the same thing for a lateral adjustment. If, you know, if it's taking too heavy a cut on one side or the other, again, you just tap on the iron, and of course it moves relative to the plane body. But even if you do that, the last thing you want to do is set that wedge. Now, the same principle, in theory, applies to molding planes. Uh, but in that case, there's so little mass in the irons that in order to get them to move differentially, you really would have to whale away at that heel. And so it's really much better in that case to simply release the iron. And since, since they're tapered, that's easily done. And then back the iron off uh, so it's not quite cutting. Reset it. And we, we like to do our iron so that that it's in the proper orientation when it's resting against the blind side uh, of, the, of the wedge mortise, and then adjust it down. And, be, you know, and even in that case, whoops, tapped the wrong thing there. Now that's set to rank, and this is a, a situation where you, know, you could, in theory, back it off by wrapping on the heel, or, but it's just... And ranking a, a ranked set is too full a too, cut. Too heavy a yeah. cut, yeah. Uh, so, you know, if you want to back it off with a molding plane, it's really more expeditious to simply remove the iron and start over again. It only takes well, a second. that's great. Okay. Now I know what to hit, why to hit it, and what, uh, what it should, should be when it's set correctly. Okay, well, I hope, I hope that clears things up to some extent at least.
Crowder has been on the bench and waiting with eager anticipation of this new Lee Jig product. It's the buzz in the woodworking world. It's all about beehives, or is it? Lee quality and innovation continues with the B975. It's a simple to use jig for routing one half and three quarter inch box joints with that patented Lee joint fit. From a box to a beehive, box joints can be routed in boards up to 17 and 13 sixteenths wide. Also, it can be used on your router table. They thought of everything. Now I can take care of a bunch of projects on that honeydew list. There's nothing like a new product from Lee Jig to make me smile. Improve your woodworking experience. Sign up for Wood News Online, a monthly newsletter showcasing the latest news, tips, and classes Highland Woodworking has to offer. By signing up, you'll receive the latest episode of the Highland Woodworker, special store promotions, and Wood News Online delivered straight to your inbox. Sign up today. That's all the time we have for the show today. But check us out on social media and come back to see us next time on the Highland Woodworker.